I'm going to talk today about uh, killer snails and their link to biodiversity. Um, in the Philippines, we are blessed with a very high amount of biodiversity. Uh, we are at the Coral Triangle, where that includes um, the Philippines, Indonesia, and part of New Guinea. This is where most of the species are found, particularly in the uh, Verde Island Passage of uh, Luzon. And um, we have uh, many, many more species that are undiscovered. And in fact, the Sulawesi Corridor is at the, was thought to be at the heart of the Coral Triangle, but the recent studies suggested that it's actually in the Philippines. So when we were at the College of Medicine in the University of the Philippines in Manila, we got interested in snails that could kill people. Okay. And it was Dr. Oliveira, my uh, colleague at the uh, Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, who knew about these killer snails because as a boy he collected snails from the seashore. And so we thought that by looking at these killer snails, where we have uh, a lot of in the Philippines, we will have an advantage over our competitors in research because they don't have the cone snails and we have it. Although they have all the equipment for um, doing work, then they don't have these uh, species that are so beautiful and are a uh, collector's item. And if you go to the villages, the cone snails are actually eaten. And uh, in fact, when we went there one time to uh, get snails from Marinduque, the fishermen said, oh, you're too late. We got a bucket full of conus magus, but uh, they are now boiling it for lunch. So, <laughs> so we were quite late then, but you know, in the Philippines, we have many, many more species. We have at least 300 of the over 600 species found worldwide. And the uh, killer snails that we, we are so curious about is Conus geographus, the most dangerous cone snail. It is a fish hunting species. And the victims of geographer cones are are paralyzed much faster, you know, when, when you than uh, that of uh, snakes. When uh, you get stung by conus geographus, it will take only about 10 minutes for the victim to feel the paralysis, and then the victim may die in 30 minutes. And the fatality rate that was um, uh, studied by Yoshiba of Japan, who injected himself actually with some venom, you know, as part of his experiments, he uh, estimated a fatality rate of 67%, which is quite high. Okay. And so this uh, geographus is a fish eater, but there are other species that eat worms and others eat uh, snails, other snails, and other mollusks. So among these different species of cone snails, it's the conus geographus, it's the fish eaters that are most dangerous to man because they affect vertebrates. And in worldwide, um, the stinging cases of conus geographus and other cone snails are mostly in the Indo-Pacific region because this is where the cone snails are found mainly. And they can sting, they can inject a venom because they have a well-developed venom apparatus that consists of a, a venom bulb that is believed to 
push, to push the venom through the venom duct. Okay, it's very muscular. Then B is the venom duct where the venom is synthesized. C is like, um, it's, it's like a pocket where there are different harpoons at uh, stages, of varied stages of formation. So there is shown the harpoon where you see the sharp needle-like uh, uh, tip. And what is shown here is just one half of the harpoon. So you can imagine, you know, it's quite long. And when the snail is ready to sting, it positions one of the harpoons at the tip of the proboscis, okay, which is D. The proboscis can be elongated by the snail to more than, no, more than its length. So it can reach out to any victim in the, in the sea. There are many, many different cone snails, as I said, that are right now 680 are, have been verified to be a species belonging to cone snails. So, and there are those that are very much related, which formerly were thought to just belong to conus, but there has been a new reclassification of species in this genus, and some of them have been delegated to another uh, genus. And um, the, each venom of the cone snail has uh, at least 100 to 150 different components to 200 components. And so if you estimate the num total number of cone snails and multiply that by the number of peptides that can be found in each venom, then you can have anywhere from 70,000 to 140,000 or even 200,000 different uh, peptides that can be studied. And uh, so we started this, we started the study of cone snails when we were at the College of Medicine. And so the first one that we picked was Conus geographus, the most dangerous cone snail. And what we wanted to do, we thought it would just be a one to two year project, was to find out what in these cone snails can kill people. Okay. And then later on, we found that there are so many peptides. So in addition to just using the old techniques that we started off in 1970s, uh, we are now using modern technologies, and I think the development of our studies on cone snails parallel the development of techniques that are more uh, that are more sensitive, techniques that are faster, and uh, otherwise, you know, it would have taken us uh, many, many more years than what we did. We were able to do, and. So since there are these cone snails all over the Philippines, one of the things that worried us was that like in Cebu, you know, they gather snails uh, in containers and big containers of snails and other marine uh, products are shipped out and uh, they are sold in Hawaii, in Japan, and you know, and, and so what we uh, did was to try to talk to the fishermen. And uh, we did conservation and community development uh, information dissemination. We requested scientists from the Marine Science Institute like Perry Alino, who helped us uh, organize workshops for the fishermen. So the uh, assistance of Perry Alino went there with us to help the, f the fishermen assess the uh, coral reefs that are in Morong Bataan. And uh, these uh, fishermen who don't have, you know, the regular scuba diving suits that the, uh, our divers from MSI have, uh, what, the, what they did was to improvise. And they also 
Some of them, though, in addition, uh, some of them have been knew about the uh, illegal fishing activities that are going on. In fact, some of them were involved in dynamite fishing. But when uh, the leader of the group, Karesti, uh, told them that you know we should work together because our catch is becoming smaller and smaller, we should protect the coral reefs, uh, they started confiscating the, uh, the um, dynamites the homemade dynamites, and one of these is shown at the bottom, you know, in the middle of the bottom uh, illustration. In addition to having, um, to helping the fishermen uh, cover biodiversity or be involved in conservation of biodiversity, there is now a move from the marine people uh, who realized that actually some of the sediments that are coming from the mountains are affecting the, um, the organisms in the ocean. Because if you have lots of, lots of erosion, this will then uh, cover some of the coral reef uh, organisms and they will die. So we went to um, trying to reach out to the people of the mountains and among these are the Aitas. This shows, you know, the Kanawan Aita Reservation uh, and if you look at the mountains, uh, if you look at the mountains there, you see these bald mountains, denuded forest, and uh, part of this reservation is being used for farming. But the, if you if you want to go see a forest, you have to walk up farther. So the lower parts of what used to be lush forest. Are now have now be converted to farms, and some have uh, are uh, have been uh, subjected to logging and uh, charcoal making, and so we also did uh, want to bring science to communities so that they will understand why it's so important to have uh, conservation of what is around us. So we uh, talked to the communities, explained to them about the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act, explained to them about biodiversity. And I used to bring my uh, civic welfare training service course students so that they can teach the young ones about biodiversity and also the older uh, ones, the heads of household, about biodiversity. And we and embark on a project that was supported by the Philippine Conservation uh, Foundation, Philippine Tropical Forest Conservation Foundation, which supported us for three years uh, in uh, trying to uh, give the ITAS some uh, information about biodiversity, conservation, and then we also incorporated livelihood in, in that project. We have two biologists at that time, two field biologists, namely Ulysses Ferreras and Leonard Koh. And we had the social scientist, Borromeo Mutin. Okay. The training uh, in biodiversity and inventory and parataxonomy was part of the project from PTFCF. So you see here the ITAS collecting samples and uh, preparing the vouchers for uh, delivery to the herbarium. And among those that were found are two orchids, uh, which were first, for the first time was found in Luzon. We also taught them about uh, growing uh, seedlings, you know, from uh, forestry seedlings from the seeds that they have gathered from the forest. So they uh, were taught how to set up nurseries. And so they maintained this. Uh, about, uh, they were planting about uh, more than 30 different species of forest trees. And in addition, they also had a project on agroforestry so that some of these plants that they have plant, that they have um, planted there um, 
will become their source of livelihood later. For example, among these is the cashew nuts, there's bananas, coconuts, guava trees, and some fruit trees, in addition to the forest trees. And another aspect of the work is to finding out what the traditional medicine of the Aitas are. And Grace Yu from the College of Medicine, who is uh, in our collaborator in this project, I studied the functional food of the Aitas. And among the functional food of the Aitas is rattan. You know, rattan, the, the, what we use for uh, furniture. The shoot of rattan, in particular the species limuran or calamus ornatus, is eaten by the Aitas. They said that um, if you eat this, even if you're have a, having stomach trouble, if you are having diarrhea, that will surely uh, cure your uh, diarrhea. And then they also said that it makes them feel good. And so this was developed by Grace Hsu. She studied this and she found that indeed these rattan shoots, when uh, eaten or when given to animals, can reduce the motility of the gastrointestinal tract. So that's why it can help alleviate yung diarrhea. And then she was able to isolate compounds from this. And she, in addition to the anti-motility activity, she found that this can have uh, anti-inflammatory activity and also anti-cancer uh, activity. And the anti-inflammatory activity of rattan in combination with another plant has been developed as a tea that can uh, that is good for um, rheumatism. If you if you have painful knees, it helps. And I've tried this. Uh, Chancellor uh, Menchi Padilla has also tried this, and a number of doctors in PGH have tried this and are now using this uh, herbal tea. And this will also be developed as as capsules, as pure compounds that can later on be sold as drugs. So by um, making use of the, our natural resources like rattan, it's, uh, that has been developed into a drug and against inflammation and a drug against diarrhea, one can uh, help the ITAS earn more from what they have. And if people can use, can get this hidden uh, wealth from the forest, they, then they don't have to cut down trees just to earn the measly amount from uh, charcoal making. And also, we have developed drugs from the cone snails. You see, the cone snails can kill people, but the venom have been used to develop drugs. Like the one that was developed from Conus magus, is now commercially known as pre-alt or primary alternative pre-alt to morphine. It's a hundred times more uh, active than morphine. But since it's a peptide, it has to be given in a specialized manner by injection into the intracerebral uh, fluid, spinal fluid. And so it is used only for those who have terminal cancer and no longer respond to morphine. So these are just two examples of what we can get by studying our natural resources. So we really have to preserve our biodiversity. You know, in addition, right now, most of these, of the, uh, biodiversity we have, most of the trees and the marine resources we have, they are exported raw without any processing. And so we get very little from this. And if we can develop this into higher value products like as drugs, herbal teas, and other items, then that can really help uh, alleviate poverty in rural areas. And uh, this is also a way of educating the people 
in not only educating the community, but also educating the scientists to go there. Because one of these interactions, um, so, so like mutual learning experiences, resulted in this book, which is a guide, pictorial guide to the plants of the Bataan National Park, which was written by Ulysses Ferreras and Leonard Coe, who are both botanists. And, but this was co-authored with two Aitas. So because they are the ones who knew about, who know about the plants, who could tell them what are the uses, who could tell them about when these plants flower, when they will bear trees, and what plants are being eaten by the animals, what plants are, are important for maintaining the biodiversity of the animals in the forest. And so the Aitas really are against mono cropping, that is planting the same trees in the forest for, for, wild, for the National Greening Project, you know, most just to facilitate the planting of uh, trees in the, in the forest that they want to, to restore. What has been done is to say, uh, put all plants of mahogany, all plants of, uh, you know, one type of plant. But they said, if you do this, then you want, uh, the animals will not have anything to eat because they don't eat some of these plants that the National Greening Program uh, uses. And uh, so, you know, in the way that we have been, as we studied from cone snails, the cone snails, we learned about the communities because we have to interact with the communities in order to be able to get samples of these snails all over the Philippines. And by doing that, we learned to interact with the fishermen. We learned about what they're doing, how they can, uh, 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 how we can help them in uh, conserving the resources that we have. In the same way, by working with the ITAS, we have also learned a lot from them, but they have also learned from us about, you know, scientific names and, uh, the uses that we can derive from this by using chemistry, biochemistry, molecular biology, and uh, other, say, pharmacology. So the studies of our natural resources should be done together with the communities and in collaboration with uh, a multidisciplinary group of scientists. And uh, we have to empower the communities to conserve their resources because they are the ones who live there. And our empowerment and uh, approach and for sustainable development is to integrate the study of their culture, education, health, and livelihood. For the ITAS, the most important thing is preservation of their culture, followed by education, and then they said after education, then you can have earn money, you can get employment, and that health is the last in their indicators for development. We have developed together with them, we have developed a social cultural development index that was we defined together with the ITAS. So they assigned 40% uh, to culture, 30% to education, 20% to livelihood, and 10% to health. So what we did was to use some indicators, sub-indicators that will measure these uh, main uh, indicators of development. And we measured this in 2005. Then we, we measured them again in 2010. So we found an increase in most of these uh, indicators, except for cultural heritage, because dumadami yung mga mestizo and mestiza, okay? And, um, but now we are, un we are now doing a survey uh, along these four indicators to estimate how much the parameters have changed and to see if the development that are going on now, if the development interventions that we have introduced, that other people have introduced, have led really to the development of the ITAS and not to the decrease in their sociocultural in development index. So I think what 
uh, we have, you know, is starting from a chemist. Uh, now I stayed many, many years in the lab, just concentrating in the lab. But our access to the community, our link to the community are in terms of the samples. And uh, now I think our uh, interaction with the communities are much richer than maybe what we have contributed to science. So, and uh, so with that, I, I uh, believe we should all be um, work together for the empowerment of communities if you want the country to be sustainable. <laughs>